Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today I'm going to preach on the Old Testament text that our sister Janice has read just now. Uh, Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. Last week, uh, Brother Tim preached on the topic peace at times of anxiousness. Peace at times of anxiousness. And it's Philippians chapter 4 passage. We will experience peace from God through reconciliation, through prayer, through worship. Uh, today, I want to share the topic of meeting God in low times, low points of life. Uh, and this is taken from the story or the event of Moses in Exodus. Now, we read the passage that Moses uh, have a dialogue, a conversation, pleading with God. But the context is, uh, is very, very sad and very, very despairing. You know, imagine that the children of Israel was delivered out from Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and there was so much miracle happened through the mighty hand of God. Crossing the Red Sea, and we have this lectionary reading about a month ago. And what crossing the Red Sea means is like baptism to us. We enter together with Christ unto his death and then resurrected together, raised up again with Christ. But the Exodus does not stop there. The Exodus continues on until they come to Mount Sinai. And that's the context of Exodus 33. When they come to Mount Sinai, it's where God made a covenant with his people. Moses spent 40 days on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Words of the Ten Commandments together with the rest of the laws. But, but also the tablet, stone tablet, the God's own finger writes on it, the Ten Words. Oh, that represents sort of the climax of, of Christian experience, experiencing God. Not just we repent, we die with Christ, we raise with Christ, but also God Himself become our friend, become our Father. God Himself made a covenant with us. And I always like this analogy, you know, imagine that, you know, an orphan, no family, no parents, and then there's a family that decide to adopt that orphan. And if the family, let's say, is low, you know, I'm alone. So that child who has no parents, no serving, become adopted into my family and becomes alone. How wonderful. And that same thing happened with the children of Israel. They were slaves. They came out. God chose them out of so many people, not because they are powerful or wonderful, just because God decided to show love to them. And when they came out, and God said, I adopt you as my children, as my people. That's what happened in Mount Sinai. A covenant. God made a covenant with Israel. Wow, how wonderful. But guess what happened in Exodus 32 and 33? When Moses was there 40 days, when he came down, the people was building another idol in the form of a golden calf. And they say that, you know, this person, Moses, we do not know where he's gone, he probably died. Let 
us make another idol that worship and say this calf is the one that delivers us from Egypt. And there's a lot of celebration, rivalry, uh, rivalry, and you know, all sorts. And then God came down the time with Moses, saw this, punished them, and many were killed. And very sadly, in the beginning of chapter 33, God said to Moses, I'm no longer going to go with these people. I'm no longer. I'm going to send my angel, but I'm not going to come with you anymore. You go along to your promised land. On hearing this, the people were so distressed. They were remorse. What happened? But distress. They mourned. And they took off their hand ornaments as a sign of griefing. And that's where we are in the story of Exodus 33. A low point. When God says, I'm not going to come along with you, that means my presence is no longer to come with you. And that's serious matter. When we read just now in the passage, Moses asked God, God, if you don't come with us, what would differentiate us from the rest of the people in the world? If God is not with the church or with us, how different we are to any other people on the streets or other religions so-called in the world. We're no different if God no longer present with us or come with us. That is how serious it is. Guess what? Another serious thing happened. You know Moses went up? The stone, the tablet stone, with the Ten Words of the Ten Commandments. When he came down, the tablet was thrown on the floor and was broken. It signified that the covenant that God made with Israel was broken. That's sad. It's like adopting someone and that child or the father or decided, break the agreement, covenant, no more. I don't accept you anymore as my child. You know, in newspaper nowadays, we see that, isn't it? That time they need, I'm not sure about stars, but in Chinese newspaper, a lot of times, in the front page, you have all this notification uh, saying that so-and-so no longer is my son, or so-and-so is no longer my father. Announcement that no more. And that happens usually it's because of that. Uh, in the Penang or Malaysia context because of loan sharks and all sorts. In order that the loan sharks no longer come after my family, my father or my son. So I declare that I no longer have any relationship, a paternal or true relationship uh, officially. So that they escape from the, all these uh, fights. But that's what happened. It's a low point in the people of Israel. It's a low point in Moses' life. And what happened? What happened then? On the next slide. Moses did three things uh, that I'd like to share. The first one is Moses reminded God that God, you know me by name and has found favour with me. You know this, this saying that God, you know me by name and has found me by favour, the same passage has happened, probably written about three times. Three times. Moses can remind God, God, you say you have known me by name. And I found favor, I found favor with you. 
A lot of times, when we read the Bible as if people or intercessors are reminding God of His faithfulness, His righteousness, everything, I got a sense it's more of God reminding the people of His righteousness, His faithfulness, His love for us. So here Moses, as if he's reminding God, in fact it was God stirring in Moses' heart, reminding him that pray to me, ask me, claim, acknowledge. And this is what happened when you and I pray. Sometimes Holy Spirit in our hearts would stir us and help us to say, God, you are not like that. You will do what is right. Help me, you will save me because you have promised to be my father, my shepherd, my stronghold in times of need, my provider when I am lost. It is God actually that reminded us. So Moses acknowledged that, make the claim, acknowledge that God, you have always known me by name, meaning very personal. And that I found favor with you. Now, perhaps Moses has been a good chap. You know, the Bible does say that Moses was the most humble person in all the earth. But when God says, "I know you by name and I found favor," it is more than just because you are a good person. Moses is a good person. What? When God first introduced himself to Moses, Moses was a coward. He didn't want to obey God to follow. He kept pushing away. He says, yeah, send someone else. He was a coward. But more so, he was a very broken man. You know what God says? God says, you by name and you have found favor with me. Same with Paul or Saul, the great apostle that wrote half of the New Testament. When Jesus introduced himself to Paul or Saul, that time his name is Saul, in the road to Damascus, he was a rascal. He was a self-righteous brat. He thinks he knows everything. He thinks he's doing things for God. When in fact, he was doing absolutely the opposite. But God says, you are persecuting me and I'm going to send you to do something mighty for me. And God has already chosen you to do mighty things for you. Did God chose Moses, uh, Paul because of his wonderful skill and heart. No, God chose him because God chose him. Same thing. When God reached out to touch you, 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 us, me, and say to us, I know you by name and I found favor with you. It happens before we do anything, good or bad. He calls us, He chose us because He chose us. He loves us because He loves us, because He loves us, because He loves us, because He loves us, because He loves us. It's a wonderful mystery. It's mind boggling. Even today, I cannot grasp it. I've been Christian for a long time. And I've been very zealous for God. I remember even when I was a young person, at the age of 14, when I decided to give my life to Jesus, I was very zealous. And in my zealousness, however, over the years, you know, I also experienced a kind of self-righteous attitude. You know, that, you know, I'm a better Christian than another person who is not as zealous as me. 
And these things happen to me. And I have to come to realize that God not only chose me and loved me and know me by name and found favor in me, another person who is less zealous than me, God equally loved, equally know by name, equally found favor in His Son. It is a tremendous mystery. In fact, people have said the real goal in our Christian life is not so much of knowing your Bible better or growing in the knowledge of God. It's not even so much of growing in to become more like Jesus. The goal is to know that you are God's beloved. God's beloved. Do you know how much God loves you and I? How much He knows us by name and how much He's pleased with us. Look to Jesus. Twice the heaven broke in silence and told, break down and say to everyone, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. God the Father speaking to God the Son. Moses need to hear that. In this low point of his life, he is still known by God. And God favor him. The next point, turn the slide, the same slide. In verse 14, and then verse 17, it says, please come with me, in verse 14. In other words, don't leave me. God, if you say you know me by name and has found favor with me, don't leave me. Don't even send your angel. I want you, God alone, to come. And that's what happened in verse 14. And you know what God says? He says, yes, okay, I'll come with you. But Moses wasn't content. You know what he says in verse 17? He says, don't come only with me, come with us. Come with us. And that's a true sign, a true character of a believing community, a Christian community, a church. Or a Christian leader like Moses was never satisfied that only God is for me and me alone. That my Christian life is a private one. Oh, I like to enjoy God and God alone. God bless me. Enough. If you read the Bible, when God says He loves you and loves I, He always wanted us to be together become a family of God, to become a temple of God consisting of His people, to become a body of Christ. Some of us will be finger, eyes, toe, some are more presentable, some not presentable, but God says that those who are not presentable parts are given more honour, so that in all parts there are equal care and concern. And this, this is in First Corinthians, I think. And that's our God. Moses says, come with me. But not just me, come with us, God. Don't leave us. Because the presence of God is what distinguishes us from any other nations, any other religion. If today our church, St. George's Church, God is no longer present with us, we are the most piteous of all people. We only just become religious. We only will become ritualistic. We come to church because we just do it as a routine and the rest of the days we have no God in our lives. Because God is no longer present with us. And Moses says, please don't do that. This is your people, come with us. 
And guess what? God says yes again. In Moses' intercession, I will do that. I will do what you say. Because I know you by name, and not just you, I know each and every one of the Israelites. I know them by name. And I, they have found favor with me. The third point Moses did, which is incredible. We show the slides of Joel. The third thing in verse uh, 18. Then, the Bible says, Then, show me your glory. Wow, show me your glory. It's a bit strange, isn't it? Eh? If you read a few verses before, uh, it was talking about the tent of meeting. So this is before the tabernacle has been built. So Moses was asked by God to pitch a tent outside the camp. And the Israelites can go to inquire of God to Moses in this tent of meeting. And in this tent of meeting, God is written here, God would speak to Moses, verse 11, face to face as one speak to a friend. Wow, how much more personal is that? How much more wonderful is that? And somehow crossing the Red Sea, the children of Israel witnessed the pillar of the cloud during the day and the pillar of fire during night time, leading them, preventing the Egyptians, attacking them, and you know, all sorts. They saw the glory of God. Some more here. Moses said, Show me your glory. Not enough. One Bible teacher says this, he says, in times of discouragement, the best remedy is to have a fresh vision of God's glory. Let me repeat. In times of discouragement, the best remedy is to have a fresh vision of God's glory. I think that's what Moses asked. I want to see you again. This is one of my lowest points of my life and your people. Show me your glory again. But to me, when I read this verse, I've also the thought that this is actually a genuine sign, genuine sign of Christian growth, a Christian maturity. A Christian relationship with God. The more you know God, the more you enter into a relationship with God, the more you want to see God. <laughs> the more you want to see His glory. And I think that is a genuine sign. And over here we see that God says, Okay, again, okay, okay, I'll show you my glory. And he says here, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I proclaim my name before you. Uh, and a little bit interesting is that, you know, when you go up to Mount Sinai again, I'm going to cover you in a cleft so that when I pass over, you can only see my back. Because if you see me face to face, no one can leave. My see my face face to face and die and leave. Uh, this, is a, this is a topic of another day. Uh, this is a profound mystery there. But God's glory is equipped from this passage, you know, equipped with God's goodness and also equipped to God's name. God's goodness, God's name. And that's His glory. And the two things mentioned here about God's goodness, His attributes, I have mercy to whom I have mercy. And I have compassion to whom I have compassion. That's the two things. If you read the scriptures, especially praying the Psalms, you experience that our God is a God of mercy. And how much we need mercy in our lives. My wife's favorite song is, New, every morning is new. 
The love of God for me is wonderfully new. And the other one song is Miss Mercy is new every day. How much we need mercy every day. And how much we need God's compassion in our lives, don't we? To know God loves you, you know. Compassion means calm passion. Passion means suffering. Calm means together. When God says, I have compassion with you, that means I suffer together with you. I am with you. So any one of us here who are really suffering, having low in your life, remember, God says, I suffer with you. I have compassion with you. When we read chapter 34, wonderful, and that's not the topic today, Moses saw the glory of God, and he heard his name be proclaimed. He says, the Lord, the Lord. Gracious, slow to anger, full of mercy and love, showing compassion, forgiveness, sin, but does not leave the guilty go unpunished, etc. The words. And those are core, key declaration of the Jewish and Christian theology. And when we see the glory of God, we will become more and more like Him. It's like lovers. Yeah? In, now, in our group, uh, you know, my wife and myself, and, and a few of you, you know, and, you know, that there's this young couple who is in love. And we, we always share about this couple who is in love. And, and you know, the, it's so nice to be in love. Sometimes I say that, you know, that's what happened to us who are married too long. We need to fall in love again. And sometimes we look at all these young couples falling in love and we say, wow, now that was how we were before falling in love. We can't wait to get home, you know, to see each other. And you can't wait to go out, you know, but tall, dating. And you know what? The couples who are together, the more they are together, the more they look like each other. And that's what happens also when we see God's glory. The more we are intimate with Christ, the more we will be like Him. His faithfulness, we become faithful. His mercy, we become merciful. His compassion, we become compassionate. His righteousness, we become righteous. His love, we become more love. I'll end with this slide, two slides, and we'll quickly finish here. Next slide. So before this, the next slide, before this slide. So what is God speaking to us today? At the lowest points of our lives, God shows up. God knows us personally by name. He knows your history, good or bad, and still loves you. God shows favor simply because of God's love. God does not leave us. God is present with us. That's why our Anglican words, the Lord be with you, is so powerful. When we say to each other, the Lord be with you, and also with you. And God is willing to show Himself much more to us than even Jesus today that we know. And that God today he has shown Himself through His own Son. And I'll end with the verse, uh, passage of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 3. In the past, God spoke to our senses through the prophets at many times and in many various places, ways. But in the last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. 
And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Amen.